So now we go on to verse 8. I call verse 8 the word corrupt. Corrupt. Here's what it says. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Now our first question is, who are these two men? In a previous verse, he named two men that were part of the church and who'd gone away. But who are these two guys? What we think is that these two men are the two men back in history who opposed Moses. In fact, that's what it says. As Moses was being called upon by God to rise up and to face Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, let my people go. And he did some uh, spiritually empowered things. Like he held up his staff and God said, Moses, throw your staff down and it became a serpent. Well, Pharaoh's magicians came along and said, we can do that. And they took their staffs and they threw them down and they became serpents as well. And then Moses did this and they did the same thing. We think that these two men were part of that group of magicians in Pharaoh's court. And Paul uses them as an example to say these men not only scheme, they not only deceive, they actually oppose the truth. They came against Moses and said, Moses, your God is no better than our God. Moses knew that he was, and God did demonstrate that he was more powerful, but their goal was to prove that Moses' God was no better than theirs. They opposed the truth, they were corrupted in mind, and they were disqualified regarding the faith. That word disqualified is a term used in the metal producing industry. I've never seen it for myself, but in, in doing the research on it, whenever you want pure metal, you heat it extremely high. They have these big containers in which they put the hard metal and they heat it so hot until it becomes a liquid. What happens is when it becomes super, super hot, the impurities inside the metal begin to rise to the top of the surface. So as the impurities rise to the top, these metal workers skim off the top and take the impurities out. Then they pour the pure metal into these molds, and as it hardens, they can say, this is pure. This is all silver or iron or gold or whatever particular metal it was. But the word here used for disqualify means that there are impurities still left in there. The, the, the metal coins that were made back in the first century and for many centuries, they, they would pour into little molds, they would stamp them, and the, the weight of that coin would be the value of money that that is. But scheming people would say, if we would add a little bit of different, cheaper metal in there, we can produce more coins with the same amount of metal, and no one will ever know the difference. It will still weigh the same. That's what people who oppose the truth are like. They deceive, they push back. You say, well, what does that look like today? There's a statistic in America, which I only know the statistic for America, but as they asked American people and as they surveyed them, they say, do you believe in God? The latest surveys say that somewhere between 85 and 90% of people in America believe in God and go, that's great. Thank you, Lord. But does that mean that they're all Christian? The answer is no. When they ask some more survey questions and they break it down into particular beliefs as to what it means to be a follower of Christ, do they believe in the Bible? Do they believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And they ask a variety of questions. Do you know what they find? That not 85% of people have a belief in Jesus Christ for salvation. About 15% have a faith that transforms in Jesus Christ. 85% of people believe in God, but only 15% of people have an active understanding of what it means to be in relationship to Him. Do you know what that means? The difference between 85% and 15% is 70. That means that 70% of Americans, almost three out of four Americans, think, hey, what I believe is just fine. I'm safe. I'm good. You know, if there is a heaven, I I'm going to go to heaven because I believe in God. And I go, wow. Someday, that large group of people is going to be so shocked when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, um, and Jesus says, I, I never knew you. 
In fact, it reminds me of some things that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He said these words in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Can you imagine being one of those individuals standing before Jesus Christ one day? Hey, Jesus, it's great to see you. Oh, life is over, but it, it's wonderful to finally see you. Can I come in now? And Jesus says, he's looking in his book with the, the, the names, and he says, I'm sorry, I don't see your name. And they say, oh, no, it's, it's Joe Smith. You remember me. I, I went to church once. I, I believe in you. I, I believe that you're real. I, I need to come in, right? And Jesus looked through his Lamb's book of life. And he said, I, I don't see your name. And he says, Joe Smith, depart from me. I never knew you. Can you imagine the horror? And me being as a preacher and a teacher, I can't even imagine the horror of being a preacher or teacher or a pastor of a church and misleading the people and directing the people away from a relationship with Jesus Christ. I can't imagine the horror of a pastor who doesn't believe in the Word of God and who for years has led people to a path away from God. That in essence, they oppose the truth they're corrupted in mind. They're disqualified regarding the faith. They're not pure. That statement again, you know you've met God when you see change in your life. You say, but Bruce, I, I don't see a lot of change in my life. Ask somebody whom you know, do you see change in your life? If you're not seeing any change, then it's time to ask the question of, do I really belong to Jesus Christ? It's a good question. Well, there's one verse left, and it's verse 9, and I would give the word caught, like being caught in a trap or finally caught after trying to be captured. The verse says, But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of these two men. S sometimes it greatly discourages me. Lord, how can so many people teach truth that is not truth? How can you in America, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, in, in Russia, in South America, in every country of the world, how can you allow people to teach truth that is not true? This verse gives us hope. It's as if God is saying to me, Bruce, don't worry. These people will not get far. Their folly will be plain to all. It will be exposed. I will show them for what really truth is and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Bruce, you can trust me because I know all. Say thank you. It's enough for me to be passionate, to be a student of God's word so that I teach accurately. That it's enough for me to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with everybody else. I can't watch out for everybody else. There's too much information out there today. I can't even sort through it all myself. What you're asking me to, de to do is to teach your truth that changes people's lives. I can't change people's lives, but you can. Lord, would you do that in our church? Would you do that through the teaching that I do in this class? Lord, I'm not the best teacher that there ever was. I don't pretend to be, but somehow you can take your words and get it into people's minds and get it into people's hearts and you can change them. So let me ask you a question. What kind of gospel are you putting your trust in? We say that Paul is always about the gospel, always about the gospel. What kind of truth are you putting your faith in? TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com.
There's a man in our church. He and his wife and his two children came to our church about eight months ago now. He was a part of another church in our town, a church with which I'm familiar. And there were some disagreements with the things that their particular denomination was doing. And so they began to search for another church. And I knew him from the community. I had met him a number of times. And so they came to our church. And when they came to our church, it was, it was funny at first. The, the church in which they attended, the, the pastor's sermons were 12 minutes. And I said, I'll, I'll warn you, I preach for 30 to 40 minutes. It's going to seem pretty long. And they said, okay, we'll be ready. And our music is pretty lively. And, and they were used to music that was, it was very stoic. And I said, our, our music's going to be different. So they came in the first Sunday and I said, how are you? I said, are you kind of nervous? And they said, well, we're a little bit nervous. And so I said, well, come on in, meet some of our, they knew a lot of the people in our church and they went in and sat down. And we sang our songs and I got up and preached my message. And on the way out, I said, okay, so, so how was it? And he said, that was really good. And I said, okay, my message was long. It was four times as long as what you're used to. How, how was it? And I wasn't looking for a compliment. I didn't mean it about me, but I, I wanted to know. He says, I learned so much in your message. And they, came, they kept coming uh, week after week, and he became involved in a theological Bible study that I led this winter. And, and I describe him as a sponge. If, if you know what a sponge is, when it's dry, it's completely dry. It weighs almost nothing. But if you put a sponge in some water, it soaks up all the water and it becomes 10 or 15 or 20 times heavier than it was when it was dry. Steve was like a sponge. He just couldn't get enough. He, he was being fed so much and you could see it in his face and you could see it in his wife and his kids began to enjoy the church. And again, I don't mean that to, to compliment myself. This man, for the first time in his life, was really getting into this book. He was hungry. And he said to me words that I will never forget. He said, Bruce, I never knew what I didn't know. I never knew what I didn't know. I, I thought I knew the scriptures. In fact, he was a leader in his church, and he even wrote a Bible study. And he went back a year after writing that Bible study, and he says, I didn't know anything. That this book and its words are powerful to change lives. It is truth. It doesn't just contain truth. It is truth. The book of Hebrews says that it is living. It is powerful. It is active. And that you can grow as the Holy Spirit does his work through the word of God and through our involvement in the church, through the preaching and teaching of God's word and our connection with other people. Of all the means that God could have used to spread his gospel, he chose to use people like you and but those of you who are hearing these words or are watching these videos, you now are possessors of the truth of God's word. You can share it. You can use it to grow your own. And God can change you and he can change those around you as you live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, that brings us to the end of verse 9 in chapter 3. We're going to take a short break. And this kind of ends the, the, the negative part of Paul's warning, he begins to say something very positive and encouraging in verses 10 and following of chapter 3. So we'll take a short break and we'll come back in a few minutes. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, 
Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300, or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.